Welcome to the Half-Blood Report. Here we discuss Percy Jackson news, interviews, and all things Ryordan. I'm Samuel, your co-host. And I'm Diego, your other co-host. And I'm Izzy, your guest host. (laughs) Yeah, so uh, Izzy's back, and you know what that means. We're going to be talking City of the Plague God. Yeah. Uh, Ryordan review. It's um, 12... 11 months after our first predictions with you, Izzy. Or, no, no, not tw- 13. 13 months. 11 13 months. months. Less, less than a year. Oh, wow. More, more than a year. Okay. That was yeah. correct. <laughs> it's, it, it's been more than a year. Izzy, this is, this is the end. How do you feel going into this? I'm just um, surprised no one made fun of me for my mix up of the numbers. But yeah, Izzy. It's fine. How do you feel? It's good. Um, yeah, I feel good. You know, episode number five that I've been here, and yeah, it's it's Ooh, fun. Somebody's keeping track. <laughs> I... <laughs> um, anyway, uh, Samma, you want to start us off? Yeah, let's jump into the demigod news. Um, first up, the newest, the not even, it says newest in the show notes, but this isn't even the newest. This is the first uh, anthology book from Rick Riordan Presents. It, it already has a pre-order link. Is it an Amazon pre-order link? Yes. Do we encourage you to support your local bookstores? Yes. Am I going to put our affiliate link to Amazon in the show notes? Uh, yes. So <laughs> um, it's the only because it out, yeah, it's it's not available yet to get on like independent bookstore websites. So I would encourage you to hold off until it is then. But yeah, for for now, some information on this. Uh, there's going to be a, a short stories written by Roshani Choksi, J.C. Cervantes, Yoon Ha Lee, Carlos Hernandez, Kwame Mbalia, Rebecca Roanhorse, Taylor K. Mejia, Sarwat Chada, Grace D. Kim, and the man himself, Rick Riordan. They're all going to be writing short stories for this anthology. The description is as follows. A cave monster, an abandoned demon, a ghost who wants to erase history, a killer commandment. These are just some of the challenges confronting the young heroes in this highly entertaining anthology. All but one of the heroes previously starred in a popular book from Rick Ryan Presents. You will be reunited with Aru Shah, Zaino Obispo, Min the Fox Spirit, Salin Gabby, Tristan Strong, Nizoni Begay, Paola Santiago, Sikander Aziz, and Riley O. Oh. Who is the new hero? Read Rick Ryan's short story to find out. Um, dun, and dun, dun. So this is crazy. Uh, the title is The Cursed Carnival and Other Calamities, New Stories About Mythic Heroes. Uh, also, this is a not going to be a normal anthology book. This is just not a bunch of short stories about your favorite Rick Ryan Presents uh, characters. Carlos Hernandez and Sarwat Chada talked on the press tour about how there is some connectedness. So I suspect Sal and Gabby's short story will be about the colliding of universes, and I suspect there will be Easter eggs relating to them throughout the anthology. So this is going to be the book that finally connects the Rick Ryan Presents universes into one multiverse. over time. (laughs) Yes. Diego and I have been talking about this from the beginning of the podcast. Rick has always been very adamant that these are separate universes. He does not control them. They're not part of the Percy Jackson universe. But ever since the introduction of uh, Carlos's Sal and Gabby, the multiverse has been a part of Rick Ryan Presents, and I cannot tell you how excited I am. So yeah, if you want to use the Amazon link instead of uh, the bookshop link whenever that is coming out, the Amazon link is in the description. And well, I am excited. Uh, I can't wait to <laughs> you can, the Oracle you can text on this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, but, like seriously, how often? Like by like we're getting we're getting reunited with all these characters. Most of well, not most, but like a couple of who has have ended their series. Paula Santiago have ended her series by that time. Zane Obispo, his series is over. He'll probably appear in um, Retton's spinoff series. Isn't Paola a three-book series? No, pa- Paola, I think, is a duology last I checked. Maybe that's changed. Mm. I don't think so. Mm. Uh, Nizoni, Race to the Sun, was a one That's a one-off. Sikander, currently City of the Play God, which we're talking about later, is also a one-off. We would really like a sequel to that, but currently this is the next time we're going to see Kander and possibly the last. So that's you, just, you Lee? yeah. Min the Fox beer also pro that was a, no, I think, I think Stephanie Larry, Stephanie yeah, Larry something... like late 2019, early 2020 yeah, yeah, about yeah. like a dragon pearl spinoff. We've heard nothing on that. So I, yeah, nothing, uh... nothing at all. We know that there's some sort of like resemblance in the thing. Wait, maybe that, 
was she was she tweeting about the carnival of calamities maybe the short no, story no, there I, I don't think so but i definitely i definitely think that we've heard from yoon ha lee i i went to yoon ha lee's um uh event with rick riordan back on the uh on the uh, Tower of Nero tour, and um, they were talking a lot about kind of what they wanted to put in this spinoff. So I definitely think the spinoff is concrete. I'm just not, I don't remember for certain whether or not the, oh my God, I'm blanking on the name. What's the name of the main character? Min Fox Spirit? Yeah, I don't know if Min is going to be in that spinoff. I assume uh, uh, they'll be there in one form or another, but I, I'm not Oh, so you're thinking it might be just be like, oh, well, this Yeah, this... same universe, different story. Okay, so rundown, Carnival Calamities, every published Rick Ryan Presents author and plus Gracie Kim have written a short story for it, plus Rick Ryan. They're going to be interconnected via Sal and Gabby. The pre order link is already out. We already have a title, which is really cool. There was there was some questionable, like Rick Riordan on his Tower of Nero tour was like just saying the hero anthology, which because hero is the main theme. But yeah, Cursed Carnival. And also this is going to be where we learn about Rick's interpretation of Irish mythology. Ooh. That's going to be Rick's story. Yes, yes, yes. Goody, 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 goody. So we're, we're very pumped for that, as you can understand. We, we are indeed pumped. Next thing on the Demigod news. Um, this is also just... Amazon, which is kind of sad, but this is a free yeah. thing. This is a free Amazon, so you just gotta get a free thing on Kindle. Um, but the the first two chapters of the Last Fallen Star are available to read for free on Kindle. We're Ooh. not going to go super in depth on this because we figured if we start breaking this down, then that's just an oracle section. This episode is not doing an oracle section. So next episode, next week, come back. We will be breaking down those two chapters and talking about the Last Fallen Star. Yeah, last up on the news section, uh, not really uh, news since we've kind of mentioned it a lot. Our interview with Sarwat Chada did make it onto a Reed Riordan article, and we just wanted to thank Reed Riordan for giving us a shout out. And also, if you guys haven't checked out uh, Reed Riordan's little mini blurb uh, on our interview, do go check it out. And if you haven't checked out the interview, then what are you doing listening to this episode? <laughs> <laughs> go check out the interview. <laughs> yeah. Do that first. You see, there's there's two combinations you could be listening to right now. Samuel Diego and Izzy, or Samuel Diego and Sarwat Chada, the offer of City of the Play God, the newest book from Rick Ryan Presents. So, uh, okay you know. then. Sure. <laughs> Izzy, Izzy, Why just not? Got, like, <laughs> Izzy, you got to fight back. Tell Samuel. Well, uh, head. Sam, you're a poo poo head. <laughs> you poo poo head. <laughs> Yes, Izzy. You you tell Samuel. Yeah, a rough. <laughs> so let's move on to our next section. Yeah, Ryan and review the section in which we either review a recent Ryan and book or a reread. And today's Ryan and review is surprise, surprise, City of the Plague God, the Mesopotamian mythology inspired book by Sarwat Chada that we've been making predictions about since 2019. Uh, so, yeah, as is customary, let's uh, first talk about this one spoiler-free. What did you like, Izzy? So this is where I don't talk about what happens in the book? Yes. Yeah, just like okay. writing style, uh, general, just general like, comments. Yeah. Okay. I like, the, I like the general just kind of vibe that it had, where first off, the book takes place in New York. So as someone who lives in New York, it was fun to piece together where things are happening and sort of have that map, which I guess that's very helpful. Wait, wait, you actually do that with books? Wow. Yeah, like don't? It's not even even like me making fun of you. Like, I'm actually actually surprised because being a Rick Varden fan, I've read countless books set in New York City, and I have never made any effort to actually try to connect this to my oh, own I, life. Oh, I definitely have. Yeah. I've I've tried to like look at the places and kind of try to do some sort of cuz cuz Rick lives in Boston and sometimes I just make sure that he's getting the stuff right. Because sometimes I'll see these yeah. these weird transitions. You realize he like lived in I don't know if it was Texas or California, but it was one of those when he was writing Percy Jackson. So he did. Yeah, there's this whole like sequence in the Sea of Monsters where like the Gray Sisters 
are riding around and Percy's listing all the streets. And I just, I've always like been like, either did a bunch of research onto all these streets when he was living in Texas or California, or they're- He made them up. <laughs> and that, that is why I have never, ever tried to like look at a book because I don't want to be taken out of the fiction by recognizing like, oh, this author didn't do a Google search. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, we we have interviewed him, so I'll say I definitely believe he 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 probably did a Google search, but that was early on in his career, so I'm not I can't verify that. Yeah, yeah, that was a really really important question we missed for the interview. Um, no, did you Google search? <laughs> yeah, did you Google search streets for New York City? No, but I I I never do that with books. I never try to like connect places and books to real locations e even though i've read countless books set in new york city i've just never thought to do that i thought that was a thing that people didn't actually do but okay you've you've, you've two have proved me wrong i'm yeah, the outcast no. yeah <laughs> i thought i thought that's the the stuff everybody did everybody kind of well I, it's not like i'm drawing out schematics or something like i'm just thinking about it in general like Oh, hey, I know that street. I wonder yeah. how long it would take them to get to this other street. Oh, I didn't even If I don't know something off the top of my head, I will not even try to think about it. I would just keep reading the next second. Because I don't, because I don't, yeah, I, I feel like if an author is writing well, and very often they are, you don't need to have any knowledge of the local geography where the book takes place to follow the story. And so I kind of like to read it from the perspective of maybe someone who's never been to New York City and just try to understand it from there which is what I usually do with two books. Moving on, because that's a very minuscule detail about City of the Blue Yeah, Dawn. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so Samuel, what did you like? Oh, yes. As Izzy said, I love the whole vibe of the book. I'm sure this has happened with another author I've read before, but I've never noticed it so strongly of Sarwar Chada. You can really feel his presence in the writing, and I mean that in the best way. Yeah. Through all the superhero references, um, some intentional, some I'll get into later, I think are actually unintentional, but are just really cool. Should just like the the humor, the characters are not all like none of them. Like Sikander makes a lot of jokes, and some of the characters make jokes, but the humor overall has this kind of tone that just makes you think, "Oh, Sarwacha!" Like I know his style of humor from the press tours I've seen him on and having it talk to him, and so it's just I can it's it's just overall I can really feel him in the writing, and it's just. Very interesting. I, I want to kind of go back and reread all the other Rick Ryan Presents books because I'm sure it's the same there. It's just almost uh, stronger here. He is, he is, he's just very in control of the way he writes tonally. And yeah, the, the whole book is very consistent in that way. Like it has darker parts and it has lighter parts, yeah. but the whole book just yeah, kind of... Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, one thing I, I loved about this book was it was all great. Mm. Don't get me wrong. When, whenever I read any of the Rick Riordan Presents books, they're amazing. But 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 there are, there are certain parts that, you know, I feel more inclined to kind of, like, read over that page, like, slightly faster or something. And I felt as though it did happen sometimes in City of the Play God. There's definitely some pages I kind of skimmed over a bit quicker than others. But I felt as though I was doing it a lot less. And I think I actually commented this to Samuel before the interview when, when I finished the book that it had taken me, usually books take me uh, under three, was it 300 pages around? Um, it would have only taken me two hours, but this time it actually took me three hours. So um, I was This I was is just surprised. a way for you to brag about <laughs> your no, 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 no. I this swear. Is not yeah. I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to explain this in the best way that I know. And that is by, by kind of trying yeah, to... So, uh, guys, if you didn't know, I can read books really, really fast. <laughs> no, I am no, no, no. And, uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> Samuel, stop. So, I'm trying to get to the point here. God was a good book. <laughs> no, 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 stop. Yeah, Diego. Just, I felt as though I was skipping, reading through it a lot slower, which I think is kind of a testament to how good the writing was and how much less i was skimming over some pages i don't know this sounds a bit like yeah in case you in case you all don't know Diego's just a, a huge skimmer like he just skims <laughs> every single book he's ever read he never reads he yeah. always skims so he no i do read. reading a book <laughs> <laughs> shush samuel i okay 
I have an interesting way of reading. Let's just make this like a very small side tangent. I have an interesting way of reading in which I remember everything that happened in the book, but I cannot tell you the names of any of the people in the book. That's just how it works. That's not I, who was the main I, character, Sadiq Play <laughs> God. If you don't no, no, know, I that remember one. that one. Sikander Aziz. Sikander Aziz. Okay. It's just any other Rick Riordan Presents book. You guys have probably heard it when we do Riordan, Riordan reviews, in that Samuel has to tell me the name of the character because I often forget the names of almost every character that I've read about in the book. No, uh, but actually, I don't think we're getting to spoiler territory yet. Um, but what thing that I thought was very interesting is that Sikander is the hero of the story. The way it is told is his, his perspective, it is first person. Overall, mm-hmm. looking at the story in the way it is told specifically, Sikander is the hero. But there is strong implications throughout the book. It's even said in dialogue that Bellet, the sidekick, in Sikander's story, is actually the main character, the main heroine of this story, and Sikander is a side character in her story, and I feel like if you did a, like an analysis of the plot, you might actually be able to find a way, Bellet, to be following the hero's journey instead of Sikander if it were told from her perspective. It's just very interesting. I don't know if I've ever read a story where the, the main character could so easily be translated into a side character in someone else's story. It just... The, is am is am I the crazy? I don't I don't want to get into spoilers, so don't say oh you're wrong because of this part in the book. But like, is that the general vibe you all got? No, no, I definitely feel as though Sarwat has somehow managed to make two characters with a very strong personality and two characters that are are on their own path. These two characters are on a path, and they have just happened to interconnect at the right time right i feel as though there's there's a quest and there's an arc for both of them and the arcs just happen to meet but i i could i could totally see the book written from Bellet's perspective with sikander as somebody that she bumps into because it's just it's two characters that are very strong and that their relationship with each other and their strength individually from each other kind of uh carry the book in 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 a very uh, big way yeah and that's very interesting because sarwa was actually talking about i don't i don't know if he talked about this actually in our interview i don't remember i know he's talked about it in, their, in like the press story or maybe in another interview i don't know if i don't remember specifically if he talked about it in our interview but he has talked about how D D has taught and formed his writing in a way that he has learned to make sure that all his characters are there for their own personal motives. Like, there's no character that is ever in his story because that's what the plot demands, that's what the story needs, that's what another character needs. Every character is there realistically in a way that would actually suit them. Even if it's just to support someone else, It's it makes sense that that character would specifically want to support someone else in that part of the story. And so that's something that Sarwat has talked about, uh, but you really have to read the book to fully understand like oh yes th- this is very interesting they're both on their own path in life and this story could be very slightly reworked for another character to be the main character just because how strong they all are what do you think of that izzy yeah i totally agree with that that wasn't something that i initially picked up on while reading it but hearing you talk about it definitely seems i know i see now that there is a lot of this sort of D style of every character does something and contributes to the story in a pretty large way, whether even the side characters that we do see who will remain unnamed as this is the non-spoiler section, even they do have, they are full characters. They're not just one fact about them that's important to the story. They have, there's more to them than that. And they have special items and whatnot. Oh my goodness. When that I not we're about to get in spoiler review, but can I just say when that character w- revealed the thing that we understood but he didn't fully understand and Sikander understood and then Sikander said that thing to him, like my heart was like, "Oh my goodness. I cannot believe what's happening. I'm so emotional." Um okay, so let's get into the spoiler section and I will play yeah. a little spoiler clip we have from Diego all those episodes ago. 
Spoiler. All right, so yeah. Um. <laughs> that was that was that was the worst and best transition in the history of damn transitions. Uh, so oh yeah, in case in case you didn't know what I was talking about before, I was talking about the moment when Dawood was like, "Mo always said I would be a hero," and then and then Cicada's all like, like "Yeah, you're a hero." hero. <laughs> and then but he's like you have become a hero because you got this immortal juice um also, <laughs> i feel i feel so stupid we never i don't i don't think we really ever went into depth onto how gilgamesh could be still around despite the fact he died in the myth and that was like oh, the yeah. main thing the whole story revolved around that we were this close to unlocking because i'm I, I think we referenced it in episode 12 i actually think I actually think it might have been Izzy who who talked about how since Gilgamesh died in the myth, how are they going to incorporate him into the story? Exactly, like, exactly. We did not go in depth. We did not do like we did not. Even, we knew the myth. We had watched videos talking about the myth of <laughs> Gilgamesh. We were this close. We, we were like we were like one brain brain connection away from the fact that he almost had immortality in the myth. So why couldn't he have immortality in Star Wars interpretation? Oh my goodness! Do you two not feel stupid? Because I feel like I do. I do. I do feel stupid about the whole. I feel like, like yeah. we did a disservice to our audience. We did a. We we are failures. We are not geniuses. We do not make good predictions on this podcast. I'm not a genius. And we're we a are, disgrace. Yeah, it was the flower. It was the flower all along. I felt so bad about that because we. That's like the key part of the myth, and we did so much research, and we just completely. Like, we, just we, skip the flower part. Yeah, I know. Just... I I can tell that part of the myth. I've I actually don't remember much of the beginning of the myth, but I remember cool. that part. His whole freaking quest for immortality. That's the cool part. And I didn't even think. Oh yeah, Gilgamesh's flower, immortality. In our last, in our final predictions, you were even talking about. Hey, how did Sikander get his his powers? Because we know he probably has powers. And we think, oh yeah, the thing that actually in the myth can give you powers. Ooh, yeah. I know. I think it was pretty uh. He called a lot of other stuff. To be fair, we did get some other predictions correct. But yeah, I think we like predicted. Hey, we predicted our chariot. I predicted. I predicted our chariot. Yeah, was- chariot, jaguar chariot. Yeah, you predicted the the big red button, and then I did a bunch of predictions about um. About like Ishtar and that stuff. That was pretty good. We we called us. She a, wasn't a, the main villain. That was a. She was not theory. the main villain. No, mm, that was that was, that was yeah. pretty bad theory. What was my biggest brain theory that I had? I don't know. I had know. a pretty big brain theory. The Someone original one. No, 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 no. I don't know. Someone listened to to all our play god predictions and tweeted us what the other biggest theory was. But speaking of Ishtar, I I was talking earlier about how Sarwat leaves a lot of uh, superhero references. There's a part where Sikander is looking through her mind, and then it's World War II, and she's jumping off buildings. Uh, of course, and so that is strong. I realized Wonder Woman was a different World War, and when she jumped off buildings, she did not reach planes. But come on, does that not scream that Wonder like Woman? It does, it does, it, it is does. a superhero thing. But like, like no, but you you saw Wonder Woman the movie where she jumped off a building also in that I think that part also took place in France. So Yeah. Just saying. World War jumping off French buildings and being bullets. this goddess sounds like doing bullets doing sounds bullets. like an unintentional Wonder Woman reference by Sarwat there. So I don't know. Yeah. It might just be that superhero stories like jumping off buildings and that kind of stuff. That is just like a general superhero thing. So yeah, I know, yeah, but I totally, like the, I totally had uh, the Wonder Woman scene in my mind when I was like reading that part. I agree with Samuel. I te- I definitely imagined like Wonder Woman just sliding across the ground and blocking no, bullets and that stuff. I, I I think Izzy is more right in that it's just a generic thing that happens with superheroes and the gods. I mean, ancient gods from mythology are essentially just superhero stories. As Bellet says, the Thor conundrum. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah, that's especially what makes this one different is that they're sort of gods, but also there's the acknowledgement, which is another important thing here. Is sorry, I just got to completely pivot off that, but the acknowledgement that they are not 
gods in the sense that we think of them and they aren't mm. technically immortal they just live for a long time and that was that was pivoting into another part of it where like something that we talked about a bit in the things was how Sikander is Muslim and how that's going to play out with these big ancient gods mm. and I thought that that was another like just really well done part of it was how we were able to get those two things together and it's something that we've seen before in Magnus Chase with Sam the Valkyrie and how they like understand that but we saw more here and like even with the Thor thing that's the same kind of god relationship we're seeing yeah I actually I actually liked this version of having uh like a Muslim who believes in uh you know Allah, but also deals with mythological beings. I actually like this version better than the one we got in Magnus Chase because I don't know. To, in Magnus Chase, the way Rick wrote Samira and everything, it was a side plot. It was a it was a yeah. very yeah. minor thing. Yeah, but the the way Rick wrote Samira and everything, it felt more like kind of writing off any kind of problems Samira might have with the Norse gods. It was like. Yeah, I'm cool with it. I still believe in a greater god than all of them because they're kind of more minor gods. And I mean, that was fine because it wasn't as important to the story, but it didn't feel like we were delving into any problems Samira might have had with it as deeply as we could have. Well, here, I think it was more well addressed when a god straight up tells him, hey, we're not really gods. We're just, that's the best word to call it. We're just super, super powerful beings who are kind of immortal. But yeah, you're right. There's probably a, a bigger God than us and you're fine believing in what you believe in. So, because we didn't get that kind of... Uh, it's been a while since I've reread the series, so I might be wrong, but we never got a moment where like a God tells Samira, your beliefs are valid and it's okay. She has to justify it for herself. Why here, it makes more sense that Sikander would still have total faith in his beliefs because a, a, a mythological being is straight up telling him, Hey, your beliefs are valid, you know? Yeah, no, no, I definitely I definitely thought this was this was a more interesting kind of godhood in the sense that they they aren't they aren't Ares, right? Cause when Ares gets like stabbed and and uh Percy like defeats him, right? We see him like ten seconds later, like sitting on his throne, just chilling, right? Whereas with with this, death definitely felt more permanent. Wait, and it what are felt... you talking about? What do you mean? Ares comes back like 10 seconds later. In the Lightning Thief? Yeah. No? Before the Council of the Gods. He's sitting there on the Council. You're getting... When they you're return getting, the bolt. You're thinking of the movie. No, there's no Council of the Gods in the book. I'm pretty sure there is. Is there not? No, he, he just walks into uh, Zeus and Poseidon. Only Zeus and Poseidon are in the room. Oh, only Zeus and Poseidon are there? Okay, okay. Well, my bad. Ha-ha! Get your fandom card revoked. Yeah. Okay, well, whatever. Basically, the point is that Ares was probably fine, right? And it definitely felt as though these gods were a lot less powerful, but a lot more empathetic because of it. Because when you think about how the Olympian gods are portrayed by Rick Riordan, it's definitely more of uh, cold, right? They're beings who've been there forever, and this is just another flash in their memory. And they don't really care too much uh, for the people, and they don't really feel much empathy. Whereas I feel as though in this book, there's a lot more empathy because they're not as powerful and they kind of understand this this mortality and they understand how human feelings work. Yeah, and that was also just morality, or not morality, um, mortality. That was also just kind of a thing in this book, like the idea of what morality, not mort. I can't speak words. Mortality. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, mortality. That was also just like a big thing that we talked that well we didn't talk about it, but it was in the book about with everything and the death and the plague. Yeah. Yeah. And I also want to go back to your thing about the Greek gods being cold and not so much here. That's also a very purposeful thing on both offers parts. Rick is writing these series where the gods are kind of questionable and the whole point of the series is like, should Percy really be defending the gods? Well, that's not so much the point here. Like 
in this book, Nurgle bad, and we gotta fight him. And when Ishtar is portray is portrayed as like having more of a heart and really caring about Bellet, because we're supposed to care but, when she dies. But we also have to acknowledge the fact that Sarwat shows the other side, showing how Ishtar doesn't really care that much. She cares more than the Olympians do. But she's still a war goddess and is still totally open to killing a bunch of people or getting a bunch of people killed. I totally agree with yeah. that. But it's but it's more different. Like when when the gods describe immortality, even in Charles Apollo, it's oh yeah, a century is like the blink of an eye for us. Well, like we never get a description like that here. The gods live as long as they do, and it's a long time. Sikander is worrying through this book, like, I'm gonna be immortal. That's gonna be crazy. Well, I'm gonna have to take it one day at a time like he thinks of immortality in this book as being just as slow and monotonous as our own life which is really i mean not great for the gods but it's just that sh obviously ishtar could have been portrayed if you remove the the parts of her like where she's caring about bellet ishtar would have been portrayed in a very s similar way to the greek gods besides the immortality thing and it's just the fact that when we get that parts of her caring about bellet which sarwat very purposely showed then we really do care when she died. We feel bad for Bellet. We feel, you know, bad for her. And it's 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 a it's a big moment in the story that kind of propels all the characters forward. And I just think that's kind of interesting, different way to show gods that we, we get. I mean, I think it's just awesome that Rick Riordan presents has basically spawned this whole subgenre. I mean, of course, it was there before. Rick Ward and Sarwat were writing mythology books before this, and I mean, for, I mean, William Shakespeare was also taking mythology and combining it with real day elements, right? So it's just a thing that's been around for a time. But I like the having it be middle grade. We have this whole kind of subgenre we can analyze and talk about the different ways to incorporate gods, um, literally and thematically, and how like that emotionally too like how how are we supposed to care about these gods there are immortal beings who could destroy us with a snap of their fingers so are we supposed to really care about them or are we supposed to be scared about them and sometimes authors are like yes <laughs> yes yes <laughs> what are you supposed to be yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> no but i definitely feel as though sarwat addresses it um in a much more direct manner yeah uh, yeah. And I also, it's also very, something I will say that I was actually kind of surprised of in this book is there's no real moment where someone says to Sikander, there kind of is, there kind of is, but there's no, I don't think there's a hard and fast moment where someone explains to Sikander the rules of this world. He gets told, yeah, the Mesopotamian gods are real, they're still around, I'm Ishtar, but it's not in the same way that kind of Percy Jackson gets told. This is Camp half -Flip. This is the rules. Here's how you can become a demigod. We're all demigods. This is the only safe place on Earth. There's no, like, Tristan Strong, like, having a talk with John Henry and John Henry explaining how this is a world for the the gods and explaining the dynamics of the world. No, 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 no. I get what you're saying. Like, yeah, it, you just kind of get it as it happens. And mm -hmm. I kind of like it, how it's just kind of like we get our first taste of the god search thing. And then we sort of figure out more of what a god surge is, but because it's more up to the reader to interpret what exactly a god surge can and can't do, it doesn't really pers not personalize isn't the right word, but it makes it more like understandable when you get to sort of make up part of it yourself. And yes. then it's whatever you think it is. And also interesting is at first I was like, that's totally unrealistic. There has to be a moment where like this all hits him and he like starts to understand the rules of the world. But I'm like, I only think that's realistic because I've been reading decades worth of books where that happens. It probably would be more similar to this book. But I'm like, also, I've never been in this mythological situation. How am I supposed to say what would be a realistic way to find out about the world and what wouldn't be a realistic way? But what I did notice is that the way Sikander learns about this mythological world and the way he kind of accepts the little steps as they go on and he doesn't get, he kind of, he doesn't kind of, boom, I get this other world and says like, oh, I get this part. Oh, I guess this also is happening. And that slow progression of things yeah. just made sense for the plot. 
it, it allowed Sarwat to introduce different elements of this other world when needed and when it made just the plot go a lot quicker a lot smoother so we don't have to learn about the things that will affect the midpoint the end all the other moments of the book you know some point in chapter six uh well um hmm. <clears throat> So I just went. I just went on a big discussion, and then Diego yawned and Izzy coughed. So, guess my opinion was stupid. Hold on. Hold on. No. Oh no! I'm sorry, Samuel. It's just, um, I I I agree with what you said. Izzy, why did you have to cough? You're making it worse. I'm sorry. Anyway, um. I I wanted to talk about Mo. I want okay. I would I, See, I would Mo is I would cool. Mo is very cool. Mo's Mo a nice character, but the one we gotta talk about that's very important. I, I assume you both I assume you both have hardcovers. No, actually I know Izzy probably no. it on Kindle. But Billy Kindle. I don't know. Does the Kindle have the bottom kind of calligraphy at the bottom of the page? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We talked you know about what, that last time. In in the author's that. note, Sarwat said yeah. that the cuneiform reads is actually translated to a snake spelled the fragrance of the plant. Silently it came up and bore the plant off. Sarwat Chad doing some next level foreshadowing throughout the bottom of the book at the bottom of the page he's telling us what specific paragraph of the freaking myth of gilgamesh is going to be important later in the book and he's telling us yes, at okay. the bottom of every page like wait, wait, this was man that in the sneak peek was that in the yes, sneak peek? it was in the sneak peek dear oh listener God. okay listener we're sorry about um we dropped the ball on this one i oh thought that God. was like I thought that was some nice calligraphy to add no. some nice character to the... No, this man was just... Like, I wasn't even sure that was going to be real words. I, I mean, okay, oh to be fair, God. I don't know how we were going to Google that if we tried. Yeah. I tried to. I looked it up quickly, but I didn't find but anything. How did you look up those symbols? I don't... You look up you look up cuneiform translation and you find stuff. Okay, so... We had 21 pages of cuneiforms in the sneak peek. Identical cuneiforms, yeah. I think it's a different one. No, it's um, it's two. No, it's the same one. No, it's not the exact because it's it, it's a, it's the same one repeating over and over again. But it's like every two pages it repeats. Um, oh, on the Kindle version, it gives you the whole chapter and then it says them both at the end. Oh. Just oh man, fun... man. Yeah, I feel pretty angry about that because we definitely could have done some cuneiform research and totally like figured out the entire plot. Yeah, I'm so mad at us. We're the worst. Sarwat, Sarwat was teasing us. He We're told us. Hacks. He told us. He told us on Twitter. He was cackling because he saw us do the entire. He saw us do the entire chapter, and he saw us talk all about it. And then he realized we didn't catch on to the cuneiforms, and he was like. He was like, ha ha, losers. He was mocking us. Okay, but to be fair, like, this is a dead language. You would have to be some archaeological major or something to, like, be reading this book and look at the bottom page. It's like, that's probably not just fancy symbols to add cool stuff to the book. That's probably foreshadowing. Let me take out my dictionary and read it. And then you read it and you're like, holy crap, now I know the plot of the book. This is the, the work of an of a of an artist who wanted to troll his readers he was, yeah he was a and we have successfully been trolled he, he's learned well from rick Riordan. Mm -hmm. he got it yes okay oh you want to talk about mo I, I did want to talk about mo i wanted to mention how mo plays a really big part in the story and how how we should probably talk about him in the underworld since it looks like the underworld if the book gets a sequel, will make a big appearance. I mean, is the sequel to the book just going to be Bellet looking for Ishtar and the Mo might just show up? Uh, yeah, or, something like that. And I definitely think, I definitely think that Alexander, since he is in the underworld with him, and Sarwat did mention that a bunch in the interview. Yeah, yeah. Totally we should have started. 
you don't think Alexander for always mentioning that. No, you think Alexander because Sarawat told us if he was going to write a sequel, he would explore Alexander the Great. Don't act like, so I have made the analysis of the book, and I suspect Alexander the Great will probably be in the book because he, uh, because he was mentioned, and also the author told me. Um, <laughs> the author told me. I'll admit, it doesn't look great. But I did, I I just wanted to bring up the conversation in general. Yeah. I feel as though the way that they portray the underworld is a lot different from <laughs> other portrayals that we've seen. It's literally just an abandoned. Yeah, it's an abandoned. All of Santiago and, and all these kids battling for their freaking lives, and then Sikander yeah. drinking juice with Mo. <laughs> yeah, Sikander. Yeah. Is having a swig of some apple juice in an abandoned train station in the underworld. Wait, the train station was in the underworld? I thought the train station no, was like... No, what, what are you thinking, Diego? That's not... No, not the train station, but I assume like it was some kind of like abandoned like subway tunnel. Okay, oh. how did Sikander like, see the train station, though? That's what I'm a little confused about. Is... No, no, he thought it was just another New York City subway station. Well, it wasn't. I know, but, like, they all have signs on them. <laughs> yes, I, I, I assume the train just had on the side one-way trip to Underworld. <laughs> Please stay with your special metro. No, board. not like that. Like, when you enter the station, it says where it is. Yeah, it says what train stop. It says this is, like, 36th Street or whatever. What, what, did he not read the sign? When he follows a carry into the subway, what is this boy thinking? I don't know. Yeah, I don't. They're like, hmm. wait. So wait, is there just okay. like a subway map in there that just has like every city and no one noticed? You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna fix this plot hole. There were there were wanted posters of him plastered over the sign. Oh yeah. Wait, but how did the wanted posted get posters get there if no one but him can see it? I just created another plot hole. I'm a terrible writer. Oh no. I don't know, but I mean, it's not really a plot hole. And then, like, he was clearly under a lot of mental stress at this time, you know, with the whole saw Ishtar die, got hit by a train thing. So he probably just was like, all right, finally some success, and then it just kind of yeah. fell apart. Uh, no, this is after he found out he was immortal. The, the boy was. He was going through some stuff. But still, if I'm about to enter the underground subway station, I would, I'm would. i not doing it because I'm following an old man. I'm doing it because I read the sign. You know, I don't know. It that I, I guess he was just really excited that some part of his city was working, is, is what is yeah. the explanation. Look, that, that felt a bit a bit weird to me. But I, uh, I don't know. It, it, it would be weird for... Sarwat to write a whole five pages as to his thought process when he found the yeah, subway. Yeah, kind of interrupted the flow like, I found a subway station. Hey, I wonder what subway stop it is. So I look at every map, but they're all plastered over with posters. Huh. I wonder how the posters got there. Like, it just it wouldn't flip the, fit the general flow of everything. But but we can say as real New Yorkers, Farwat didn't real. Google Maps this thing. Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> Hello, this is the end of the Riordan review segment. <laughs> yes, this is definitely the first time we were recording the end. There was no cutoff. There mm -hmm. is no time gap. It's happening synchronously. Everything is fine with the clips. Why are you asking about them? Riordan review over. Boom. So to translate, we were recording this very late at night. We had a very thoughtful discussion, and then uh, we had technical difficulties, and that's not fun. And we had to stay up later than we were expecting. And now um, we've had good discussion. We all would love to talk about this book uh, more, but not uh, past midnight. So it's already past midnight. It's already way past midnight. <laughs> not at one a.m. So, yeah, I would just say this was a great book. If you haven't read it and you listened to this whole episode, that is very badness of you. Yeah. So you should probably go buy the book in the description. Mm-hmm. You heard the man. Buy the book. 
Oh, but we're we're also doing a giveaway of a signed copy of the book on our Patreon if you join before the end of the month. So keep that yeah, in mind so because the end of the go, month go is really soon. Seven days. Anyways, we might be really tired and bummed out right now, but like it was actually really fun to talk about this book. It was really fun to read this book. So I would encourage you, if you haven't already, read it. I don't know. I just said a very similar thing earlier. Um, so I'm not thinking straight as I thought I was. Um, mm -hmm. case no straight thinking going on here. Yeah. Um, it's it's very late. It's all wonky, wonky That's, donkey thinking. Well, if, if we overuse the if if, you, if we over the, use the excuse, it sounds like we're lying. You gotta you gotta stop doing that. Yeah. Um. Sorry, it's early. It's early. It's like it's five p.m. We're just pretending it's late. Well, now people believe we're lying. You, you, you messed up, Izzy. You guys. What do you want me to say? <laughs> anyway, I think what Samuel is trying to say is that's it for this episode of the Half Blood Report. Samuel, where can I contact this podcast? Uh, you can follow the show on Twitter at Half Report. You can also find us on Instagram at The Half Blood Report or email the show The Half Blood Report at gmail.com. We also have a website, The Half Blood Report .com. And please leave a review on Apple Podcasts. We read and respond to those on our seasonal mailbag episodes, which is it, the seasonal mailbag is coming soon. I promise yeah. you. I mean, in my mind, winter ends at the end of February. We don't got that much time. It's going to yeah. happen. And the groundhog might see its shadow. Oh, yeah. Izzy, um, you're about to be kicked off this podcast and forced to watch uh, that Bill Murray movie. But, um, <laughs> the movie's first, amazing. Is there anything you would like to plug? Let's see. Uh, I'm not going to plug this thing I plugged last time because I hear that's actually happening now from one of the Patreons, though I am feeling a little betrayed that it had nothing to do with the Gilgamesh movie spinoff. But, you know, I can forgive you, person on the Internet. <laughs> so for actual things to plug this time, though, I guess we're going to go back to what I first plug, which is just be nice to people. Because it's a nice thing to do. And yeah. Oh, thank you for that. Thank part. you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think I kind of skipped over this part, but um a huge thank you to our patrons. They heap help they keep help. They help keep our show going by paying for a hosting service and website. There are special many okay. <laughs> I don't know if Diego is doing this on purpose or not, and that scares me. Um, yeah, Many there special are... benefits you can get by becoming patron. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would like to give a special thank you and shout out to our patrons currently supporting us with Magnus, Jason, Finney, and there's a link to our patron in the description. Patrons are awesome. Do it. They, yeah. No. I, I want to say, like, do it, like in the Palpatine voice that Diego just used. Do it. Yeah, it's it's just it, it helps us keep going. We're doing a giveaway. We're doing we're going to be doing monthly giveaways on our Patreon, and there's some. Mm -hmm. um, you got the mission magician tiered above, and uh, yeah, there's there's cool stuff there. If you can't do it, we understand, and uh, we thank you for listening. Yeah. That said, it's time for credits. A theme music was composed by me a long time ago. I do our editing. Uh, my co-host here is Sleepy Sleepy Diego, and I'm Samuel. And I'm your guest host, Izzy. This is the Helping Broken Robots podcast. The only HBO that matters. Survive till next week, or um, to sleep. Yes. Sleep. We can't give Sleeping. Izzy D editing access to our show notes again. Oh, he changed it again, did he not? Yeah. Mwah. <laughs> <laughs>